one time a used tissue was just trash. Today, it's potential DNA evidence. New scientific discoveries are turning inconsequential items into vital pieces of forensic information. This is how an alert pathologist and a piece of cartilage made scientific history. November 9, 1995, dawn broke crisp and cold over Anchorage, Alaska. The temperature was around zero degrees when a policeman on routine patrol discovered a body in a public park. We didn't have anything. We had no witnesses, nothing but the body as far as evidence goes. No tracks as far as a vehicle or a person or footprints, anything like that. So we had very, very little, and we were very concerned about it. Police took her fingerprints and ran them through APHIS, the automated fingerprint identification system, which compared them to millions of prints in a nationwide database. The victim was identified as 34-year-old Catherine Harms. A background check indicated Catherine Harms, known as Cat, had recently moved to Anchorage from Juneau, the state capital, where she was employed by the Tongass National Park Service. Catherine told friends she moved to Anchorage to be closer to her seven-year-old son. We not only just barely identified her, but we had no idea where she was living, no idea what lifestyle she had, except from the background in, in Juneau. Uh, we had no idea who would want to hurt her like that. Catherine Harms had been staying with friends, moving from place to place with no steady address in the months uh, prior to her murder. When informed of her death, Catherine's parents told police about a chilling phone message they received from her two nights before the murder. Mom, I need her. Hello, Mom. Really, really, really need your help. Oh, hopefully you'll be home soon. Bye. The autopsy revealed the cause of death was a stab wound to the chest. There was no blood around the wound, which told the medical examiner her position when attacked. She was probably in a prone position, or she was laying on her back at the time she was stabbed. Surprisingly, she had no defensive wounds. An individual who is being attacked with a knife will attempt to fend off that knife. It may cause cuts in the hands or on the forearms. And we didn't find any of those kinds of defensive wounds on the hands or forearms of the decedent. She had also been beaten before her death, an indication Catherine knew her attacker. It was overkill, really. And uh, subsequently, we, uh, it looked like a, a body that, that was done out of anger not just for the purpose of killing her. And uh, we, sus we suspected that the victim knew the person that did it because of that. Investigators learned that Catherine's ex-husband was not in Alaska when she was murdered and was ruled out as a suspect. Two days later, the Anchorage Daily News printed a story asking anyone with information about the victim to come forward. And several did, including one person living over 2,000 miles away. When news of Catherine Harms' murder was released to the public, a man called police with some important information. He said Catherine came over to his apartment a few nights earlier. He said she was high on drugs and spent the night and left the next morning in a taxi, although he didn't know where she lived. With this information, police called the Alaska Cab Company to find out where Catherine went. The cab driver said he picked up the victim and transported her back to the Spinard Hotel, uh, room 31, where uh, a female came out and took her into room 31. 
Room 31 was occupied by a woman named Maureen Malloy, who lived there with her two children. When interviewed by police, Malloy said Catherine was a friend who had been staying with her until she found a place of her own. She says, well, yes, Catherine Harms was living with her, but she was causing a lot of trouble. She was using drugs and actually engaging in prostitution in her room. And she had children there, and, and Maureen couldn't have that. And so she told her she had to leave. Malloy said a hotel clerk helped carry Catherine to her car. She said Catherine was high on drugs, but other than that, was fine. Her skin was clammy and cold, but I mean, she was, she was definitely alive. The clerks agreed that the woman was not stabbed. There was no blood on her body. She was definitely passed out. There was no way she was gonna get up and walk away. Malloy planned to take Catherine to another friend's home, but they never got there. At Tudor and Arctic, a major intersection, several miles away from the Spinard Hotel, Catherine Harms had gotten up, jumped out of the car, and ran away into the night. Police searched Maureen Malloy's hotel room and found no evidence of a struggle. There were no bloody clothes, towels, sheets, or anything else to indicate someone had been stabbed. All they found were two tiny specks of blood near the floorboard on the living room wall. DNA testing matched the blood to Catherine Harms, but it didn't help the case. She was living in the apartment. She could have cut herself and spot of blood got on the wall that way. There are lots of different ways somebody can, can bleed. So it does not prove that she was beat in that apartment. Toxicology tests from Catherine Harms' autopsy revealed no alcohol or street drugs in her system. But the medical examiner found something very suspicious. We found very high levels of flexoril in the gastric contents, indicating that she had been given a dose or an overdose of flexoril in the recent past. Flexoril is a prescription drug used to relieve muscle spasms. But when taken in excess, it can have the opposite effect. One of the unusual side effects would be a rigidity of the muscles, in a sense, as if every muscle in the body was, was tensed up or uh, held rigid. This explains why Catherine Harms was cold and somewhat rigid when the hotel clerk carried her out to Marine Malloy's car. Without additional evidence, the case was turning cold until police got a break from an unlikely place. A woman living 2,000 miles away in Seattle, Washington, called police because she had seen the article about the murder in the Anchorage newspaper. It was one of a number of items in a package mailed to her from a friend in Anchorage. She said she had received a box, a cardboard box from uh, Marine Malloy. Inside the box were Catherine Harms driver's license, the newspaper article, some jewelry, a knife, and this handwritten note. Hey woman, please burn all the contents of this box. This is very important and many lives are on the line. This would be a great favor and in all the world I trust only you. The woman from Seattle told me she wanted nothing to do with this, but she didn't feel right about it and so she thought she better call the police. The knife appeared to be clean. Investigators wanted to know whether this was the weapon used to kill Catherine Harms. The package of items Maureen Malloy mailed to Seattle was sent to the forensic lab for testing. Malloy's note asked her friend to destroy all of the contents. Forensic experts confirmed that Maureen's fingerprints were on the document. What we were interested in was the knife. It was a folding buck-type knife. And we knew from the autopsy that the injuries would be consistent with the knife. To see if the knife blade contained anything of evidentiary value, investigators sent it to a forensic toolmark analyst. 
the microscopic fine marks on each knife blade are random in nature. They're a function of when the last time the knife blade was sharpened. The irregularities in a knife blade are going to be different in this knife even compared to the next knife blade that was made at the factory on the assembly line. Robert Chen was confident he could find unique marks on the knife, but he had nothing to compare it to. Then Shen learned that the medical examiner, Dr. Thompson, had done something unusual during the autopsy. Instead of documenting the fatal wound by photography, Dr. Thompson actually excised the section of the rib cage where the wound occurred. Well, I believe Dr. Thompson went beyond the call of duty. I think it's because as a younger, newer pathologist in the field, he's much more progressive and much more open to new ideas. The costal cartilage at the end of one rib clearly showed the stab wound. The costal cartilage is very much like a uh, low density plastic in that it, it cuts readily and when it cuts it has the consistency such that it can take the tool marks quite well, surprisingly well. Chem used a substance called microsil a rubbery material that takes the shape of anything to which it's applied. It's used by toolmark examiners to preserve the very fine details that you'll see impressed and striated tool marks. So what we need is a material that will flow very well into the tool mark and then harden in a short period of time so that we can do comparisons of these very fine marks. After the microsil hardened, Shem peeled it from the rib. The question now was whether these marks were good enough to match the suspected murder weapon. To find out, Shem took the knife and pressed it down into a hard piece of plastic. This transferred the tool marks from the suspected murder weapon to the plastic surface. In this case here, it was important to find the exact angle at which the knife was used and then to replicate that angle into plastic and then do that comparison. The process with the microsil was repeated this time along the newly cut surface of the plastic block. When the mold was peeled away, Shem wanted to see if it could be matched to the marks taken from the wound. So he placed both of the microsil molds under a comparison microscope. At 50 times magnification, he was able to look at them side by side the tool marks from the wound and Maureen Malloy's knife were identical. In this particular case, the identification was pretty compelling. Plus, being a born skeptic, I find the concept of matching a tool, that is a knife, back to a piece of the, the human body to be um, pretty incredible. Bob Shem gave me a photograph of what he saw in his comparison microscope, and that was probably one of the most powerful pieces of evidence I've ever presented in a courtroom. Investigators found even more evidence inside Maureen Malloy's car. They saw a very small smear of dried blood near the ignition switch area. Of course, that was swabbed, and those uh, swabs were sent to the state crime lab for DNA analysis. Those tests revealed that the blood on the ignition switch of Malloy's car was, in fact, Catherine Harms' blood and they also found evidence in one of Maureen's jackets. Inside the right pocket, there was uh, blood stains. That blood turned out to be Catherine Harms' blood. The stains were comparable to the dimensions of the knife that we seized in the box. Maureen Malloy was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. The question haunting prosecutors now was, what was the motive? Maureen Malloy denied any involvement in Catherine Harms' murder. In my handwriting? In your handwriting. The note? Yes. There's nothing about a knife in the note. I didn't know about any knife. She refused to talk about the knife. She wouldn't say she owned it. She didn't own it. She wouldn't say anything. You could look a lot better than you do. She was baiting you. She was fucking with you for days and days and days. And you've got your kids. You've got people to think about. And you just lost it. That's what happened. I mean, we're all, we're all adults here. We can read the writing on the wall. That's what happened, Marie. 
Now let's just stand tall. Let's just tell it how it happened. Let's don't come across like the cold-blooded bitch that you look like you are now. I'm not. I know you're not. Don't tell me I don't care about my kids. I don't just care about myself. Just tell me what happened. Tell me why you did what you did. And they go back and forth and back and forth. And it turns out that Molly never comes off her story. Finally, I ask her about the knife and the tool marks on the knife exactly matching the bone in the chest of my victim. And at that time, she said she didn't want to talk anymore. Uh, she wanted to see a lawyer. But prosecutors wondered why Malloy would kill Catherine Harms. Carrie Rundle, who was at one time Malloy's roommate, told police that Maureen had stolen a sizable gun collection and planned to sell it and live off of the proceeds. She also said that Malloy feared Catherine would expose her plans to the police. Rundle said she saw Malloy put the drug Flexeril in Catherine's food, thinking it would relax Catherine and get her to talk. Marine Malloy thought she was a snitch. I believe the violence occurred when she was trying to get Catherine Harms to tell her who she had told and what she had told her. I think at a certain point, though, the violence had been so excessive that Marine realized she couldn't let Catherine go. The toxicology evidence shows that Catherine had been given an excessive amount of Flexeril, which stiffened her muscles and caused the rigidity described by the hotel clerk. Prosecutors believe Malloy drove Catherine to the park, dumped her body, then stabbed her to death while she was unconscious. Malloy then put the bloody knife in her coat pocket, leaving both Catherine's DNA and the impression of the murder weapon. Malloy also left a tiny spot of Catherine's blood inside her car. The forensic evidence proved that it was Malloy's knife and no other that left the distinctive tool marks on Catherine's rib. I really don't believe that Marine Malloy thought that the police department, the crime lab, the medical examiner's office would join together to create a team that would solve this crime. I think that Marine Malloy figured nobody would spend this kind of effort. You told him the captain... Marine Malloy denied everything and took the stand in her own defense. Who killed Captain Harms? I wasn't there. Who killed Captain Harms? I was not there. She claimed that members of the local Hells Angels motorcycle gang killed Catherine and planted the evidence to frame her. And I did not do that to her, and they would do and say anything to discredit me to cover for what they did in that room. In closing argument in front of the jury, I took the knife, the murder weapon. I took Marine Malloy's leather jacket, and I pulled out the pocket lining. I took the knife and put it right on top of the area where the crime lab had snipped the two fabric areas, and the knife fit right between those two areas like a glove. I argued that the murder weapon was in her pocket when it had liquid blood on it. The forensic science in this case was unique. Only once or twice before had scientists been able to match a stab wound to the specific knife with this type of analysis. Looking at rib cages for tool mark comparison is, is a pretty rare examination for the examiner in the laboratory because it's rare that we're going to have the conditions where we have both the ribs that are cut that have a decent tool mark on them and have a need to compare a knife to it. Maureen Malloy was found guilty and sentenced to 159 years in prison. I absolutely hate you, you worthless piece of flesh. If you ever try to get out, I will be there as your constant reminder, and I will remind the state of Alaska of the atrocities that you have committed against my sister. I covered a lot of murder trials, and this one stuck with me for a long time because it just never made any sense. And uh, at the end of it, I felt that I didn't know the whole story, and I clearly remember the judge at sentencing saying that she did not feel that she could understand 
the motive for, for the murder. Jurors later told reporters that the tool mark comparison was exceptionally compelling. Knowledge is power. Forensic science puts uh, power in the hands of the investigators, and it gives them the power to know the difference between what is definitely true and what they only think is true. The forensic science in this case, specifically the matching of the tool marks between the knife blade and the, the chest sternum bone of the victim uh, is, a, is invaluable. That made the case. Well, in this case, forensic science was absolutely key. Again, this is a case with no eyewitnesses. And yet, uh, a prosecutor can go to the jury and say, listen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, witnesses, people lie. Science doesn't. And in this case, the scientific evidence was irrefutable.